So uh, our next speaker is Dr. Tor Haugstad, our co-director of the meeting or co-organizer from uh, uh, Oslo, where he chairs uh, and is clinical professor at Sunas Rehabilitation Hospital uh, and chairs the Traumatic Brain Injury Rehabilitation Unit there. Uh, Tor did his medical degree at University of Oslo and his PhD, served in the Royal Norwegian Air Force and did residencies in neurology, neurosurgery, psychiatry. He's been involved with research on uh, amino acid transport and in clinical care and rehabilitation. So, here you go. Thank you, Mike, and, and uh, thank you, James, and, uh, and thank you also, Carol and Walter, for, for this uh, um, magnificent overview of what, what we are doing and what we can do. And I totally agree with James, you know, instead of uh, striving to put a man on Mar Mars or trying to find uh, some intellectual um, uh, creatures on d uh, distant galaxies, we should put our energies into this instead uh, and to, to ha have the p uh, patient feel well at the end of the day when, when they are leaving our uh, uh, healthcare systems. So um, I want to start with, with this slide. Uh, it's uh, an acute uh, uh, subdural hematoma, a patient that has been uh, 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 hit by some uh, kind of uh, blunt force. Uh, and uh, as you can see here, uh, the, the, uh, here's the hematoma and uh, the, the, the ventricles are totally compressed and you can only imagine what this will do to uh, the insula here, to uh, the uh, orbitofrontal cortex, uh, cortex here and to uh, the anterior cingulate cortex and all these structures that, that we learn about and, and so uh, the, the pressure also, of course, uh, continues to, uh, to uh, press the uh, brain downwards towards the posterior fossa, and uh, this is a really serious uh, situation. And so what is the outcome uh, when, when we see this patient in our rehab facility? They come from the neurosurgeons. Sometimes the neurosurgeon has to lift uh, the whole of the uh, half, half of the skull uh, off, they perform the hemicraniatectomies uh, uh, in order to have the patient survive. And, and uh, so they come to uh, the uh, neuro rehab facility, S uh, sometimes uh, and, and not uh, um, seldom in a state of minimal uh, consciousness. Uh, and uh, for some patients, they live on in minimal consciousness for days, weeks, uh, maybe for the rest of the lifetime. Whereas some patients with very similar traumas, uh, you cannot distinguish uh, uh, sometimes from, from uh, the CT scans that you do in, in the trauma facility. Uh, they recover almost fully. Uh, they go back to work, uh, they go back to their families, uh, they go back to their children and grandchildren. Uh, and can live close to normal lives, maybe with some uh, disability. So what is the reason for this uh, enormous uh, discrepancy or differences in, in outcome? Actually, we do not know, and this is uh, one of the challenges that we need to uh, address, uh, like um, James so eloquently also put it, uh, in concert, uh, neurosurgeons, neurologists, uh, and neurorehab people with a whole team of different um, therapists. So uh, I, um, <coughs> the, bra the brain that's suffering, suffering from trauma also suffers from uh, uh, not only hemorrhage, but also uh, um, uh, osmotic forces that cause uh, brain edema. And some years ago, I, I uh, did some research on uh, uh, on the pathology uh, or the mechanisms of uh, uh, brain uh, death uh, in, during uh, cerebral ischemia. And we use a, a rat model, and, and these are old data, uh, but uh, sometimes our experiments uh, 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 turn out to uh, give unexpected results. Uh, and in the first place, uh, it may be disappointing, uh, but uh, when you think of it, it may be actually interesting. So, so here uh, we uh, subjected the acute brain slices. Uh, these are the blue lines here, uh, are the control slices, control conditions. And then we know uh, during ischemia that the cells swell, and they swell because 
uh, sodium rushes into the cell and it pulls water along and so there is an enormous cell swelling. So uh, there is an osmotic shock and, and we also subjected some of these cells to an osmotic shock. And then we corrected the, the osmotic sh shock uh, with, with mannitol, this large uh, sugar molecule uh, that we sometimes also use in clinical uh, um, uh, therapy. Uh, and uh, then we took away sugar and oxygen from the media and then to see if uh, the ischemic um, uh, lesion could be somehow corrected uh, by uh, adjusting the osmotic uh, 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 forces then we, we added mannitol here. Uh, and uh, well the scale here is uh, it's a bit awkward but there was uh, 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 a large increase of uh, extracellular uh, aspartate, GABA, taurin, and glutamate uh, during osmotic uh, shock, uh, but uh, that was corrected totally when we added mannitol. So uh, during ischemia, of course, you, we know that uh, all these amino acids, they are leaking out of the cells, and I've been discussing with Jon Stamatisen the, the uh, the mechanisms by which uh, uh, the amino acids come, come out of the cells. Uh, but uh, there is an enormous increase in the release of uh, aspartate, GABA, uh, taurine here, uh, uh, almost to uh, the level of uh, the osmotic shock, but not quite, and of course glutamate here. So when we added um, mannitol, uh, we um, hope to see that some of uh, this uh, ischemic release of uh, amino acid was uh, blocked or uh, uh, ameliorated in some way. But uh, <clears throat> as you can see, that did not happen. Instead, uh, the GABA release was uh, uh, the same, but aspartate, aspartate uh, and glutamate in particular uh, showed an enormous increase in, in release. So uh, we were very confused with this, um, uh, but we told the neurosurgeons, I had uh, a neurosurgeon on my examiner's committee for my doctoral thesis, uh, that we probably should be more careful using mannitol in a clinical setting. Uh, and uh, I don't think he agreed with me, but because he found this uh, very uh, shocking uh, results. So this is uh, an example that we, we still, there are still so many things we, we need to know about uh, uh, pathophysiological processes. Uh, and re re referring to this uh, image, we don't know how, how these processes uh, uh, turn out in the indi individual patients and may lead to different uh, long-term outcome. And so um, another uh, area of research uh, we are, uh, into is, is the area of chronic uh, pain. And uh, as you can see, this is a colleague, Norwegian colleague, uh, that has done a survey with European uh, colleagues. Uh, we can, you can see the, the, um, the, uh, the prevalence of uh, chronic pain is uh, varies greatly among the, the European countries. And as uh, an unexpected result also of this research is that the Viking descendants in Norway, they have uh, the highest uh, level of chronic pain in all of Europe. Here you can see Spain, only 11%, but uh, uh, in Norway, 30% of the p population is suffering from chronic pain. And you know, the Vikings, they were known for uh, to be fierce uh, fighters. Uh, they would uh, uh, eat this mushroom and they would go into the battle with uh, the sword in hand. And if one hand was cut off, they would take the sword with the other hand and go on fighting. So what happened to uh, uh, these uh, fighting uh, uh, Norwegians? Uh, we don't know. Um, but uh, an American psychologist told me that uh, you're probably a macho cu culture. And if a macho man cannot fight, uh, he, he will uh, kind of uh, turn inward on himself and, and develop uh, this type of uh, chronic pain. So uh, there are a lot of things, uh, of course, uh, in, uh, th that uh, we do, do not know about these mechanisms. Maybe uh, uh, the, the chronic pain thing turns out to be a part of somatization. This is a famous picture from, from the Paris School uh, of Neurology. Uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Charcot lecturing, and, and here's the uh, uh, patient that's suffering from a mental uh, 
dissociation, uh, a fit of men mental dissociation. And here's an interest, uh, interested student, uh, uh, Dr. Sigmund Freud, who wrote his thesis uh, uh, on, on exactly this difference, the difference between organic pulses and hysterical pulses. And, and we still, um, um, you may correct me, uh, Susan from, uh, from NIH, uh, we, we still don't know exactly what goes on in, in terms of, of brain pathology uh, that leads to somatization, uh, chronic pain disorders, uh, and dissociation uh, that when it comes to uh, um, uh, <coughs> functional uh, motor or, uh, or uh, mental uh, uh, dissociation. So um, we're trying to, to uh, look into this again together with uh, uh, Jonas Thomatisen. Uh, what happens uh, in chronic pain patients? You know, uh, a gentle stroke or a blowing of the wind uh, that that will normally feel very comfortable. But in some patients, they uh, feel excruciating pain. The allodynia, uh, a light touch, can be very very painful. So. So why is that so? Uh, and uh, and uh, we're, t we're trying to uh, uh, look at the peripheral mechanisms from the Merkel cells. Uh, and here we can see in the, in the Merkel cells we have uh, these dense core and, and synaptic uh, looking vesicles. So, so we're studying them together with uh, American colleagues. And uh, to, to summarize, uh, we... Um, uh, we, we need to uh, devise uh, uh, better ways of understanding why individual patients have so different uh, uh, outcomes uh, when it comes to trauma and also uh, different reactions to, uh, to uh, pain and to develop uh, the propensity to develop uh, chronic pain. And then we need to uh, devise, as uh, James also told us, uh, individualized treatment programs and rehab programs. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the, the way we do it now, we, we dress all up in uh, Mao dresses uh, and all, way, all have to march the same way, uh, but uh, we are individuals, we are uh, uh, genotypically and phenotypically different, and so we need to tailor the rehab programs accordingly. Thank you. <laughs>